31. Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to do a quick review. We have been talking about uh, don't grow weary. And when our mind is weary, our body is fatigued. And uh, it causes us then our spirit to slumber. And so then our spirit man has to be revived, either with the word of God through praise and worship like we just did. And it needs to be revived. But if you don't do it on a consistent basis, it will slide right back into the place you had to bring it out of. Amen. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 5. But while you are fighting in our life, my life, your life, those who are doing and listening to it, the times in your life when the manifest presence of God comes into our time and our space, to this world and will invade. Unholy and comfort zone. All of us have unholy and comfort zones. All of us have unholy and comfort zones. And let me tell you what they what they may look like to you. Let me say it to you another way. All of us want to be in control. That control is nothing more than your comfort zone. Let me say that to you again. I said all of us want to be in control. And that control is nothing more than your comfort zone. And so there are times in our life when God wants to manifest his presence in our unholy comfort zones. And bring the beauty of his holiness there. Like just a moment ago. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 5, I mean verse 1. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Well, that would solve all our problems, wouldn't it? If we could see the Lord sitting on his throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. You know, that's what a king wears when he walks in. And above it stood seraphims, and each one had six wings, with two covered his face, two covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. We've been starting out each week with Ezekiel chapter 3. Let's revisit that, chapter 1. Chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. In Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says, For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. In other words, God's not going to take them back. You may use them or you may lose them. You may abuse them, but God's not going to take them back. They're irrevocable. So wasting our time and not fulfilling what God has called us to is nothing more than a waste of time. Did you hear that? It's a waste of time. In Revelation 1.18 it says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And it says, I have the keys. Everybody say, he has the keys. Yes. And in Isaiah 60.22, NIV it reads, verse B portion of the verse says, I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this swiftly. 
God says, what I promised to you in his time, in due time, he says, I'm going to do it when? Swiftly. God says, I'm going to come upon you and I'm going to do it swiftly. Somebody say, do it to me swiftly, Lord. Come on, tell him you're ready for it. So the spiritual atmosphere is ripe for something new. I said the spiritual atmosphere is right for something new. We just declared that out of your mouth. That this was a new season. God was doing a new thing. And that he was moving in this atmosphere where you are. Now, I don't know. I, most people don't get excited about new things because they don't know what a new thing is. And that's why you don't get excited about seasons. And so then you don't understand or you don't know seasons when they come. And the disciples didn't know the seasons they were in. And Jesus had to teach them how to discern rightly times and seasons. So the spiritual atmosphere is ripe for something new. Say, my atmosphere is ripe. For something, new. for something new. Jesus said, don't say four months and then the harvest. That's how we know seasons. Four months. He says, don't say four months and then the harvest. He says, the harvest is now. Mm -hmm. Say it's good for the people. <laughs> and John's gospel, chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus says these words. Jesus told the disciples, he says, do not say he said, don't say that. There's no faith in that. There's no faith in saying, I wait for four months. When the presence of the Lord is upon you, he says, don't say, I wait for four months and then the harvest. He says, there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you. So he said, get a vision of what I'm saying to you. Lift up your eyes and look at the fields. Look at the world. He says, for they are already white for harvest. It's already harvest time. I said it's already harvest time. God is moving and he is preparing for a radical revival that will start first with you. Revival always begins with you first. Con conformity always begins with a body of people. But revival always begins with you. The gates of hell have pushed back against us, against me, against you, those who are listening and viewing. But we are big victorious over our adversary. If you don't believe you're victorious over your adversary, then you'll succumb to him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37, it says, yet in all things, everybody say all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. In all things. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, the apostle writes, for a great and effective door has opened to me, but he says there are many adversaries. Right. Now I want you to get that in your heart, so I just said to you that your adversary is pushing back against you. Right. Don't think because you walk through the door, it's going to be fun. Right. When you go through that door, he didn't say there's going to be one adversary. He didn't say there's going to be two adversaries. He didn't say there's going to be three adversaries. He didn't say there's going to be four adversaries. He didn't say it was going to be a dozen adversaries. He said there were going to be many adversaries. You see, breakthrough is not breakthrough until you break out. When you break out, you break through. But if all you want is breakthrough, you never break out. Spiritual keys are significant to the times, to timing and releasing of divine revelation. I said spiritual keys are significant 
to the timing and the release of divine revelation. I'm not talking about information. I'm not talking about a dream you had. I'm not talking about something you thought of or somebody you heard on YouTube. I'm talking about divine revelation by the Spirit of God. Yes, yes, yes. So we're going to talk about these spiritual keys that Jesus said he had the keys. He said he had the keys to death and hell. He had the keys. He said, I've got them right here. So spiritual keys are significant to timing and the release of divine revelation, impartation, and direction in a new season. Just to arrive in a new season and not know what to do when you get there is a shame. Just to arrive in a new season and don't know why you're there will cause you to turn around and go back. Why? Because the many adversaries will discourage you. Promotion is here. I don't know if you, you can see it, but you have to see it in your mind's eye before you can reach for it and seize it. <coughs> Isaiah said, I see the Lord high and lifted up. Jesus said these words. He says, if I be lifted up, he's not wanting to be lifted up in somebody else. He wants to be lifted up in you. And then he said, if I be lifted up, he says, my lifting me up is a drawing power. And he says, I will draw it out of you. Any weights that hinders you from ascending into the presence of the Lord, Jesus said, if you lift me up, he said, I will draw it out of you. The children of Israel had gotten bitten by serpents in the wilderness because they were murmuring and complaining. And so Moses stood in the gap and he said, God seized this, stopped this killing of people. I mean, there was, there was tens of thousands of people who were being bitten by serpents. And so Moses stands in the gap and he says, God, please stop this. So God sends an angel. He stops the deaf angel from killing people. And then he tells Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent. And I want you to put it on a pole. And he says, I want you to walk out through the camp. And he says, I want you to say to everyone who looks at that bronze serpent, a look and live. Look and live. And so the writer of Hebrews says, looking to Jesus. Look and live. So if you cannot see the Lord high and lift it up, you will stay in a place of death. Did you hear what I said to you? I said you will stay in a place of death. But if you look to the Lord, not only will he draw it out of you, I don't know what it is that needs to be drawn out of you. I know that gate, uh, 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 guilt, shame, pain, rejection, hurt, violent crimes, and sexual sins are like weights to the soul. And they weigh people down. But Jesus said, I bore those things in my body on Calvary's cross for you. So promotion is here. And you must not confuse a measure of success in your life with fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Nor accomplishment with satisfaction. Or achievement with everlasting peace. Because those three things the devil will give to you just to deceive you. Great favor is coming for the next level of your journey. Everybody say, great favor is coming for the next level of my journey. When doors of opportunities, open gates, and uncapped wells are awakened vast realms of God's goodness will overflow into new fields of grace and favor in your life. Hallelujah. When we allow Holy Spirit to reshape and reinstate 
our perceptions of God in our minds, we become instruments of righteousness. And, and our hearts become vessels of holiness. Instruments of righteousness and our hearts become vessels of holiness. And Romans 12, please turn there, Romans 12. One of the things you'll quickly learn about God when you get tired of being in pain that God is not a joke. Amen. Thank you, I got one. Everybody else on a journey. <laughs> In Romans 12, look what Paul the Apostle says. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may approve what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now that sets me on this journey to discover the perfect will of God for my life. We've been talking about purpose. We've been talking about potential. We've been talking about release of purpose. And we've been talking about position. Tonight we're going to take another step to that. In, in Joshua chapter 1, <coughs> please turn to Joshua chapter 1. God comes to Joshua after the death of Moses. And this is what he says to him, beginning with verse 1. He says, After the death of Moses, my servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses assisted, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan. Now I want you to see what God says. God never moves out of timing. I said, God never moves out of timing, and he doesn't expect you to move out of timing either. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Don't get ahead of the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, and he promised to renew your strength. Did you hear what I said to you? Wait upon the Lord, and his promises do what? Renew your strength. And so, in the waiting process, several things happen to you. It's so interesting to me. And if I preach about purpose, everybody get excited about it. But if I started out telling you about the process to the purpose, you wouldn't be so excited about it. So he says, my servant Moses is dead. He says, now therefore, arise. So you've got to put some action to it. Arise and then you go over something. The Jordan was symbolic and prophetically a, a river of death. The old folks used to sing songs about crossing over the Jordan when they went home to be with the Lord. So the Jordan was symbolic as a place of death. So God says, it's time for you to get up now, and I want you to go over this death place. I want you to cross over this Jordan. Did you hear what I said to you? So, so God is trying to tell us there's a place to cross over. There, there's a dead place, and God says, I'm going to bring you to a new place. He says, I'm doing something in the atmosphere. I want you to let your faith get hold of it because it's shaking. And God says, if you put it down, if you look to me, and he says, put it down. Then he says, I'm going to draw everything out of you so that you don't sink in the joy. Amen. I never... I never wore one of those um, things that you wear when you jump in the water so you don't go down. <laughs> so then when I discovered what they were for, I stopped going to the swimming pool without them. <laughs> you understand that? And so I seen some little kids with some on, so I, I thought I, I didn't have them. So <laughs> you just assume you can blow some up in a garbage bag. I'm tired of it. Well, that didn't work. And I uh, hit the water in the garbage bag, ran out of air, and so did I. <laughs> so God tells him, he says, every place the soles of your feet should tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. 
Now that's a good place to get a hold of that promise in your heart. Every place that the soles of my feet should tread upon, God has given to me. I want you to close your eyes just for a moment. And I want to take you on a journey as you walk through this land. And God's saying to you that every place the soles of your feet should tread upon, I have given it to you. I want you to see it. I want you to see yourself on the march. Now I want you to claim it and say it's mine. It's mine. Look what God tells him. Verse 4, he says, From the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river you grace, he says, In all of the land of the Hittites, now they were their enemy. The Hittites, and he says, And the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Now God only mentioned one nation, the Hittites, but there were six other nations, and God didn't, for some reason, he didn't tell them about it right then and there. Right. He tells them about it in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And verse 5, he says, No man shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Now, you're going to have a whole lot of people who will oppose you, but God said, no one will be able to stand against you. You know, it's an amazing thing about opposition. One of the things I found out in my short period of life is that people just get confused when you oppose an idea. They don't know what to do with it because they immediately think you're opposing them. Right. Right. I don't have to, I may not agree with the way you think, but it doesn't mean I'm opposing you. Somebody say amen. amen. So look what he says. He says, no man should be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And I will not leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong, good courage. For this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land for which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong, very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it, day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong, be of good courage, and do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Psalm 16, 8, the sum is right, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. We need a greater awareness of God's presence among us. No position. We need a greater presence of God. We need a greater awareness of his presence among us and not be position driven. Are you listening to what I said to you? You said, well, you just talked to us about purpose positioning us. But purpose or position driving should not be the reason why you want to be there. Position without presence is like dwelling without existence. Position without presence is dwelling without existence. What good is his promise without his presence? Yes. What good is it to have a land of milk flowing with milk and honey and without God? Yeah. Moses asked that question in Exodus chapter 33. Moses said, God, what good is it? What good is it for us to have this land that is flowing with milk and honey? What good is that without your presence? Amen. 
Jesus says something like this. What profits a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his soul. So we, we need to be more aware of God's presence and not position or purpose driven. That shouldn't be the passion or the motivation that drives you. So what good is it? In Exodus 33, let's start with verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, depart. And go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out. Oh. Oh. That was quick. <laughs> people you brought out of Egypt. To the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And I will send my angel. Uh-oh. God said, I ain't coming. But I'll send an escort. Ain't that what he said? He said, I ain't coming, but I'll send an escort. And so he said, I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out to Canaan. Now he's not going to give you all the items. I will drive out to Canaan. Now he didn't tell him that before. So obviously there was an upgrade. So he says, I'm going to get I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to get rid of the Hivites, the Gerasites, and the Hivites, and the Jubasites. But he still didn't say nothing about the Gerasites. So still, you know, he still ain't told him all of it. So he says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. He says, for I will not go up in your midst. Least I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked people. Wow, that's, that's kind of hard, isn't it? And the people heard this bad news. <laughs> that sure is bad news. And they mourned. And no one put on their ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. And I could come upon you into your midst in one moment and consume you. Amen. Wow. Wow. You see, just before we got here, Moses had been up in the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. He'd been in the place with God. And God, you know, God writes down all these commandments for Moses. And while they was down there, then their pastor, Aaron, they convinced Aaron to make them a golden calf. Because, I'm sorry, Pastor. They convinced, them, they convinced, them, they convinced Aaron well, to go to, to, to make them a calf so that they could worship. Because that's what they were used to. They come out of idolatry. And so, and so they make Aaron, he does it, Aaron and Miriam, and, and they do it, and then they hear all this noise, and, and so Moses, like, hey, God says, you hear all that noise down there? Yeah, Moses, well, people are happy. They're praising you. God said, no, they ain't. He said, they ain't praising me. He said, they've committed a great sin, and their hearts are from me. And so this is how we get to this 33rd chapter for God to say these hard things to them. He called it bad news. And so he says, I could come down in your midst and I could consume you just like that. Now, therefore, verse 5, he says, now, therefore, take off the ornaments. I mean, this is all the gold and the silver. And I don't even know if they bothered to took the silver out of Egypt. They had so much gold. I, I wonder if they bothered to even take it. But anyway, they had so much gold and, and jewels, and they came out, and the Bible says that they would wander through the wilderness, and the clothes wouldn't wear out, and they would always have something. They got took care of them. Now, it's funny because God takes care of them until they get into the <laughs> promised land, and then they had the soul. The manna was cut off. Mm -hmm. One of the more free food. Tell the person next to you, there ain't no more free food. No more free food. See, all the commodities stopped when they got over there. <laughs> Some of y'all may not remember from my commodity. My back there smiling. She remember the commodity. So anyway, when they get over there to the promised land, God cut it off. And then they had to sow by faith. If they didn't sow it, they couldn't harvest it. Oh, that's a good one. If they didn't sow it, they couldn't harvest it. Amen. Well, that's really a good one. Amen. When they, because they got the promise, so you got the promise, so that if you didn't sow it, you had no right to harvest. Don't turn me off yet. 
If you don't sow it, you don't have a right to harvest it. So that means that if a man don't work by sowing it, he has no right to eat it. So verse 33 and 3 says, go up to a land. He says, flow with milk and honey. He says, but I will not go up. God says, I'm not going up in your midst. He says, at least I consume you on the way. You are a stiff-necked people. Now let's go down to the 15th verse of the same chapter. Then he said to him, talk, this is Moses talking, Moses says, if your presence, not your position, Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Now remember we talked about breaking out and breaking through. And the importance of having the spirit of the God and the presence of God to guide you and to direct you in that new place. Yeah. So listen to what he says. He says for verse 16, for how then will it be known? He said, well, how do we know? God came to Joshua and he says, sanctify the people because he says, tomorrow I'm going to do a miracle before you. And this is what he said after that. He said, because you have not gone this way before. So it, it's an hour where you need to draw ever so close to the spirit and the presence of God. Because when you break out and break through, you will need the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you in that new place because you haven't yeah. gone that way before. <laughs> So look what he says. Then he said to him, if your presence, if your presence does not go with us, he says, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known? How would it be known? Moses has a very important question. How would it be known that your people and I have found grace in your side. Moses went on to another place to say, you know what all the other nations are going to do if you leave us? All the nations are going to laugh at us and say, you know what? God brought them out here to kill them. So somebody needs to say, God, you have to do what you said. You can say it. Say, God, you have to do what you said. God, you have to do what you said. You see, because if God doesn't do what he said and don't do it like he said, then your neighbors and your co-workers are going to laugh at you and say, see, all them people want it was your money. This faith don't work. Mm -hmm. He says, God, these are your people and I. And he says, if you don't do it, how will we know we found faith? <coughs> he says, grace in your sight, except you go with us. So, we shall be separate, your people and I. In other words, we're going to be a holy people. We're set apart. How will we know we're set apart? Because you are what? With us. And the whole world would know that we belong to you. Why? Because you are with us. And your presence is on us. And your power is among us. And he says, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth, the whole world will know. How would they know it? Because God is with us. The one thing that makes a difference from the rest of the world is God's presence among us. That's what sets you apart. We must not become over zealous for God's provision and his blessings and lose our passion for his presence. 
if we take care of the depth, if we take care of the depth of our life, he will take care of the breath in our life. You should write that down. I said if we take care of the depth in our life by pursuing his presence, by pursuing him, he will take care of the breath, his breath, his spirit in our lives. Tell the person next to you, you must go deep before you go wide. In Psalms 42, 7, he said, deep calls unto deep. Remember, we open up with the verse of scripture in Romans 12, 1, 2. It becomes my responsibility. It becomes your responsibility to do what? To set ourselves apart unto God. To live a life that is holy, a life that is acceptable unto him. So that his perfect will is done in our hearts and in our lives. So the summer said is deep. He relates it like this. He said it's deep calls unto deep. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfall. In other words, or at the overflow, the outpouring, the flood. And he says all your waves and your billows, they have gone over me. Somebody says he's living in the overflow. You know, my grandmother was a funny lady. She would always get up and she would make her coffee. And, and she would put her cup down in a saucer, and then she would pour all the coffee in her cup until the cup ran over in her saucer. Right. And then she would take the cup out and set it on the table and drink out of the saucer. Right. And I asked her one day, and I said, Grandma, I said, why do you do that? I said, that's dumb. <laughs> and you know, of course, you, you can't say that up close. You have to say that. <laughs> you have to say that out of arm's reach. And, and I said, Grandma, I said, that, that's kind of dumb. I don't understand why you do that. I said, what's wrong with the cup? And she said, baby, she said, I'm drinking out of my overflow. Oh, yeah. I used to walk away thinking how stupid that was. But see, it was a declaration of faith. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't hear me. Yeah. I said it was a declaration and an act of faith. Yeah. Miracles change the way we see and hear things. I said the miraculous changed the way you see and the way you hear. Yes. If you can't see and if you can hear, you won't remember. Mm -hmm. I said if you can't see and you can't hear, yeah. you won't remember. Right. See, Jesus asked his disciples, he says, how is it you don't remember the 4,000? You know, I'm, they just got through feeding the 5,000. And Jesus tells them, he said, you give them something to eat. Did you hear what I said? I said, Jesus told them to give them something to eat. And their response to Jesus was, how is that? How are we going to feed 5,000 people? He says, we don't have enough money to go to the market and buy that much food and bring it back. The night has been spent. They've walked with you all day. Now we are in a deserted place, and there's no market around here, and you tell us to give them something to eat? Yeah. And Jesus said, yeah, I told you that. Amen. And so there was a little lad that was selling his lunch, and, and so Jesus takes the food that he has, and he, he, he lifts it up to heaven, and he gives thanks to it, and he breaks it, and he gives it to him. And he says to them, have the people sit down. Well, I just love that because the disciples had to know something about being servant leaders to arrange that many people right. to feed them. Right. So Jesus not only taught them how to operate in miracles, but he taught them how to operate in compassion and to serve. So he taught them, they sit down, and every single time they reached into that basket to get fish and bread to somebody, it would multiply at their hands. But they never seen themselves in the miracle, so therefore they didn't understand it. So Jesus says, how is it you don't remember that? They thought it was multiplying at Jesus' hand, and he never touched it. They did. And every time they reached in there, their hands, the miraculous that was flowing out of them, would multiply. And then Jesus teaches them another lesson on deliverance. He says, now go through the camp and pick up all the fragment pieces so that none would remain. So he's teaching them lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson. And then he asks them, how many baskets did you pick up? They said 12. The number of apostles and disciples. And Jesus is teaching them these lessons. 
And so he still asked them, how is it you don't understand this? That the miraculous is, is working through you, not me. How is it you don't understand that the atmosphere above you and around you has been conducive to what's working in you? I said to you last week, the Holy Spirit was a person, God was a person, yes. Jesus was a person, and when that person comes into the room, what happens? To An atmosphere, a presence comes off of that person, yes. and off of that person's presence, what? It emanates a what? An atmosphere. Yes. And out of that atmosphere, everything around it changes <laughs> and conforms to the atmosphere. Every time Jesus came around, everything changed around him. When he came around, demons would manifest. People would cry out. Sickness would manifest, but it would have to go. Every single time. Jesus said, how is it you don't understand this? So miracles change the way we see things and hear. If we can't see, and if we can't hear, then you won't remember. If you can't see and you can't hear, then you what? You won't remember. I bet you very few of you even remember the miracle of being saved. <coughs> it's been so long ago that you have forgot that it was a miracle that saved you. It was the miraculous that saved you. Amen. You think it was your profession. That was just an act of your will, a demonstration of your submission. The veil in heaven and earth is opening more and more before us. I think what people lack is clarity in their mind on what to do next. We talked about going through those gates. So they lack, they lack understanding and clarity in their mind what to do next. And they get it confused with what to know next. Mm -hmm. What have we turned out in the church? Everybody wants to really know what to do next. Not what to know next. Because there are so many unknowns associated with our personal purpose and our fulfillment, uncertainties in your heart always manifest the uncertainties in others that are closest around you. The uncertainties in your heart becomes the fragrance or the the attitude of the uncertainties of those in your home as a parent, those in your ministry, those who work by you. So when there's uncertainty in you, then, then the spirit of uncertainty is in them. And everybody is looking to see what you're going to do yeah. next. Uncertainties in your heart always manifest uncertainties in others who are close to you. It doesn't matter what kind of leader or parent you are. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In Hebrews 6, 11, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe. Everybody say, you have to believe. You have to believe. He is, he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. God says, I will reward you if you seek me. Yes. Why? Because my goodness and my glory are the same. Amen. Moses said, God, I'd like to see your glory. God said, okay. He said, get up there that cliff of the rock. He said, I'm going to put my hand by. And he said, when I pass by, I'm going to see all my goodness. Success in today's world is defined by super super uh, 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 that's the word I want is defined by uh, artificial that's the word I'm looking for is defined by artificial rewards of glory they're not they're, 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 they're not they're not supernatural so therefore they're artificial they're counterfeits 
Do you understand that? Yeah. I, I remember uh, this guy, I was in jail, and somebody beat him up really, really bad. And I mean, he was really, really messed up. And, uh, and, and, and they didn't take him to the jail, they just brought him straight to the, uh, uh, they didn't take him to the hospital, they just brought him straight to the jail. And um, um, he, he came in real late at night, and um, the next morning I looked at him, and I couldn't open his mouth, his jaw was broke, he was just all messed up. And, and, and he said the police had did it to him. And, uh, 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 and I said, well, why did they do that to you? Well, he, some guy he was in a bar with, he sold some lookalike drugs. Conflict, and, and they beat him up really bad. So let that be a warning to you what the counterfeit does. You didn't catch that. So success in the world is defined by the counterfeit glory of the media, wealth, power, fame, luxury, prestige, and recognition. As a believer in Christ, only what we do in eternity will last. Yeah. Everything else gets burned up. Yeah. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. I said everything else gets burned up. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul the Apostle writes, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and knowing that your labor is not in vain Amen. in the Lord. Yeah. Why? Because he said, when I come, my reward is in my hand. When he comes, he said, his reward is in his hands. And so you can say, I can wait on him forever, or you can, you can get into his presence. You can get into his presence. See, when you, when you enter into this courts and with thanksgiving and you enter into his gates, when you come, see, the kings are always fond of their courts. Yeah. And, and, and the only way you got into the king's court that you had to be in the inner court to get into his courts. So you had to be close enough for the king to summon you. Yeah. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. You had to be close enough for the king to summon you. And then whenever you came into the presence of a king, you always brought a king a large gift. You never came empty-handed to a king. Think about that on Sunday. You never come empty-handed. Y'all caught that, huh? Come on. Because, see, the king would have your head cut off for not bringing a gift to a king. See, only kings gave gifts to other kings. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tony. Only kings gave gifts to other kings. Revelation 1, 6, we read it last week, said we what? Kings and priests unto our God. So, therefore, you can come boldly to his throne of grace, to his throne of favor. Thank you, Lord. Okay? And you can obtain mercy and find favor to help you in a time of need. Why? Because only kings give gifts to other kings. And 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10 says, Therefore, we make it our aim. In other words, we do it purposely, whether presence or absent, to be well-pleasing to the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body. Uh-oh. 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 The things done where? Somebody tell somebody, clean it up. He put that in another context. He said, you're going to be judged for the things you've done in the body. You better repent. Uh -huh, so he can blot it out. Whether good or bad. Satan is your adversary. And he will send all kinds of life-defeating, joy-stealing attacks to threaten your well-being and your destiny. Jesus. He would do everything he can to do that. 
And not only that, he will do everything he can to rob you of your faith in God. Amen. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Amen. He lacks the power to steal your eternal destiny from you. Because he cannot separate you from God. Only you can do that. He cannot separate you from God, nor can he snatch you out of God's hands. Look what it says in John 10, 27 to 30. I'm not preaching eternal grace. Let me, let me put that out there so you understand that. John 10, 27, 30. I'd love to hear your comments about that. So you can go on the web page and Tell me what your comments are. I'm sure they're flying even now. Don't turn me off yet. <laughs> Jesus said these words. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father are one. But the same way you walk to him, you can walk away from him. Yeah. Right. When Elijah prayed, when Elijah prayed for his servant at Dothan, he didn't just simply ask for a confirming miracle. He didn't just pray for his servant to confirm the miraculous to my servant God. No. He prayed that his servant would literally see into another dimension. We call that atmosphere earlier. He prayed that his servant would see into another dimension. And the vision that he wanted his servant to see or what his servant saw was already a present day reality that was already activated and he saw it. In other words, it wasn't waiting to come, it wasn't waiting to manifest, it was already there. Right. And it was activated so that the servant could see it when the man of God prayed that his eyes would be open. Now, if your eyes were open this night as you prayed, what is it that you would see? Would you see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? What would you see? Isaiah said, I see the Lord. Mm -hmm. Spiritual keys just don't open gates, doors, or uncapped accessory wells. Let me say it to you again. I said, spiritual keys just don't open gates, doors, and the uncapping of accessory wells. And we talked about that a little bit last week. We talked about it. We called it your inheritance. We talked about what was stolen and robbed from your fathers, your forefathers and your mothers before you. And we said it belongs to you. And so we talked about Satan not having warehouses. So where did he lock it up? He locked it up somewhere where you, only you, had to be spiritual to go after it. You see, because your battle was not against flesh and blood, you can't climb up and get it by flesh and blood. Do you understand that? Well, let's look at what these, let's look at what these ancestry, I mean, ancestry wells are. In Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. Because there are some wells that God wants you to take note of. And God wants you to uncap them wells because there's a fresh flow that God wants to cause to flow into your life. Hallelujah. And the enemy has, has kept those wells. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Yes. Yes. And let me tell you what these keys is. Jesus said, he said, I'm going to give you keys of the kingdom. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what some of these keys are. And these are the keys that you need to pursue. <coughs> In Genesis chapter 26, are you there? Yes. yes. I'm there. Amen. Amen. 
Okay, let's look at verse 10 together. Look what it says. And Abimelech, Abimelech was a king, and Abraham went down there, and he was afraid that the king down there was going to take his wife, Sarah, from him. And so they devised a scheme and said, hey, listen, you know, just tell the guy, you know, you're my sister, and, uh, and don't tell him you're my wife, and then he won't take you, you know, put you in his harem, or something like that. And, and, and so they agreed to it. And so then God closed up the wound of everybody in his palace. And, and, and the guy's messed up. And, and, and so God, God pierced a guy in a dream and tell him, if you touch Abraham's wife, he said, I'm kidding. I like that. <laughs> but you like God talking like that? He said, if you touch that man's wife, I'm going to kill him. And so this guy gets bothered. I, I guess I'd be bothered too. And so in verse 10, it says, Abimelech said, he says, what is this you've done to me? I mean, you come into my land, man, and you got all this cattle out there. I mean, I can't even get around. You got cattle everywhere. Can't nobody go nowhere. Your cattle cover the whole, the whole ground. Nobody, I can't move. I can't even travel on my own highway because he had so much cattle, sheep. I don't know if they had pigs, but I don't know what they had, but he had a lot of them. So Abimelech, and, and, and verse 11, Abimelech charged all of his people saying, he who touches this man or his wife should surely be put to death. I like that. Ain't that good? I mean, he could just like say that about me. You, you understand that? And, and that's what he's saying about me too. Don't mess with that brother. I will kill you. And man, can't you hear God? I just, God does just love it. I mean, come on, come on. Okay. I mean, just like God just threatened him. You know, I mean, I prayed like that once. <laughs> about some people. But anyway, I repent it. I repent it. I ask God to forgive me. And what if they had died? Well, verse 11 says, <laughs> So Abimelech charged all of his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife was sure to be put to death. Man, what a charge. And then Isaac sowed in that land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Right there, God prepared a table for him in the presence of his enemy. Yeah. Amen. Everybody say, he sold. He sold. Let's just, let's just say that again. Everybody say, he sold. He sold. Okay. You know, just think now, if he hadn't sold, he wouldn't have been blessed. And so Abimelech, he tells him, he tells him, don't touch this man or his wife. And then in verse, in verse 12, it says that Isaac sowed in that land and he reaped in the same year. Now, you know what that means? That means that God took time out of the equation and speeded things up for him. Now, if God can take time out of the equation and speed it up like he said he was going to do in Amos 9 and 11, I'm in the right place at the right time. Amen. Somebody say, speed it up. Speed it up. <laughs> and then look what it said. He reaped a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man began to what? Prosper. He was wealthy before he got there. When Abraham, when God called Abraham, Abraham left. He went to where his father, Terah, was, and he waited till his father died, and then took his nephew Lot with him. God never told him to do that, but he did. And so God gave him grace. He didn't fuss with him. He didn't kill Lot on the way. So he let Lot come. And so Abraham, he goes to where his father, because his father was a big shot, and, and, and he was like, but he was an idolater. And so Abraham, he takes all of his household, <laughs> takes his wife, all of his servants, because we know he had servants, because he said he did. So he takes all of his servants and he takes his wife. So that means they had to have these wagons, I guess, and they had to haul all this stuff from one house. Then he goes to his father's house. He waited till his father died. And then he takes everything in his father's house and all of his father's servants. And then he takes Lot and all of Lot's stuff and all of that stuff. And then he travels. 
So now, now, you know, I mean, just think about it. Feed all of those animals, to feed all of those servants, to feed all of those people, to carry all of those tents. He couldn't have been broke. That's right. So, Abraham was rich concerning men, but he was poor before God. You get that one. I said he was rich concerning men. But he was poor before God. And God said, Abraham, I'm going to make you wealthy. Amen. Mm. Thank you. That's a good place to pause and say, God, make me wealthy. God, make me wealthy. Uh, the rest of the people over here don't want to be wealthy. God, make me wealthy. God, make me wealthy. Let me say it like you really mean that. God, make me wealthy. Because there's an anointing in that place where you said it. See, see, you have to touch something. If you don't touch something, then it would never come to pass. You have to touch it. God told the man, God, said, stretch out your, your staff. And it did. And it burned it up. You got to touch it. Did you hear what I said? And so so now, back to, uh, back to where, where am I? The king, the, the guy, Abimelech. And so the Bible says that Abraham prospered. Uh, and in fact, it didn't just say he prospered, it said he was very yes. prosperous. Mm -hmm. yes. very. very prosperous. Mm -hmm. And for verse 14 says, for he had possessions already of flocks, possessions of herd, herds, and great number of servants. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't have been poor. So the Philistines, his, his enemy did what? Amen. They envied him. Amen. God, listen, you can make me that wealthy <laughs> so that my enemy envied. That's why Moses said, don't bring us up from here. You understand? Moses said, look, don't bring it up from here if your presence don't. Because he says, you know what they're going to say? He says, all these nations and all these people are going to mock us and say, see, God brought us out here to kill you. See, God has not brought you into such a time as this to leave you broke, disgusted, and frustrated. Amen. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Amen. He brought you out to prosper, yes, to be very yes. prosperous. Amen. Wow. Talking faith to myself, I guess. So look what it says, verse fourteen. For he had he had possessions of all of these things, and his enemy, the Philistines, they envied him. In Isaiah eleven two it says, "The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might." the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Everybody say, those are keys. Those are keys. So see, when you break out and break through these gates, you're going to need these keys. What keys? Let me tell you what they are again. There's seven of them. The spirit of the Lord upon you, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Don't go to these places blindfolded. Why? Because on the other side through your what? Break out and break through are what? Many adversaries. Don't get discouraged. There are what? Many adversaries. But Jesus said to you, he said to me, you are what? More than a conqueror. He didn't say you weren't going to have to fight for it. He said you were more than a conqueror. He didn't say you weren't going to be bruised. He says you're more than a conqueror. He didn't say you weren't going to have your feelings hurt. You're going to be more than a conqueror. He didn't say people weren't going to talk about you because they surely will because they're your adversaries. Why? Because they envy you because you're very prosperous. Amen. Mm, mm, mm. But all they can do is stand by and watch the train. Mm, 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 mm. In Proverbs 3.20 it says, by his knowledge, the depths are broken up. You need to get the knowledge of the Lord in you yeah. to break up 
all that stony ground. See, those things are those things are are, 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 are wells that's been kept, and they have blinded you from rightly discerning or pursuing the heart of God or the mind of the Holy Spirit. To where is it? Is the treasure and the wells that are flowing to the overflow that belong to my ancestors, Spirit of God? I need you to show me, give me knowledge where they are, direct me how to get there. I mean, navigate me to that place because God, you promised it to my ancestors, and some lying devil, some enemy has put a cap on those wells, and it belongs to me. Because you said that my descendants shall possess the gates of his enemy. Amen. You've never seen broke possessors. Thank you. Father, I want to pause in your presence. And I declare, I am declaring that you're going to give me wisdom and knowledge in you. You're going to open the eyes of my understanding that they might be enlightened. That you might show me what's been stolen from my ancestors. What's been stolen from them and been kept. But the water is still flowing. Like the woman at the Samaritan well. She said to Jesus, the well is deep and you have nothing to draw with. And she didn't know who she was talking to. And I'm here to say to you, God, I know the well is deep, and I'm placing a call, deep, call on to deep. I say, 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 deep, call on to deep. And I say, be untapped, and flow, and come upon me, and overtake me. In this hour, in this season, in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation and divine, that's right, Mario. Revelation and divine knowledge are toxic to the enemy. He can't touch it. He doesn't know what to do with that. Because both positions you in a place of purpose where God's presence protects you. The battle for the keys, the battle for the keys of authority is greater than the battle for the gates themselves. Mm -hmm. One of those keys of authority, the spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of power, spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Jesus rebuked lawyers in his day. He rebuked them in his day for binding and hindering people by locking them out and keeping the keys. Jesus rebuked them for locking people out of the kingdom and keeping the keys. So, Lord, we release the rebuke of the Lord against any shepherd, any teacher, any other believer, any religious spirit, any occult spirit, any witchcraft spirit that has kept people out of the kingdom of God and kept the keys. We release the rebuke of the Lord against you. We say, be released in the name of Jesus. And we declare that the wells are uncapped and the blessings of the Lord is flowing upon you to overtake you right now in Jesus' name. Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, Jesus, you know, you know what's so good about this? Is that when the goodness of the Lord, when it's uncapped, and the goodness of the Lord comes upon you, you know you forget all the pain. You forget all the hurt you carried for years. You forget all the offenses that you had against those people all of those years. Because you were living in unbelief. <coughs> The scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And we live in a world today when everybody wants your trust. Amen. The bank of the first trust. Everybody wants your trust. The broker company. Everybody wants your trust. Trust in us. No, but the Bible says you trust in the Lord. Every time I go in, I say, I'm trusting in you. 
you got to be crazy. <laughs> You're the arm of flesh. You're a curse to me. Ain't that right? That's what the scripture said. Cursed is he who trusts in the arm of flesh. Hmm. So Jesus said in Luke's Gospel 11, 52, he says, woe to you lawyers. He says, you have taken away the key of knowledge. And he says, you did not enter in yourself, and those who were entering in, you hindered. Wow. In other words, the, the absence of knowledge yes. perverts and prevents the entry into the ways of the Father's house. Mm -hmm. It perverts, it twists, it's an iniquity. Yes. Your destiny is not waiting to be found. Your destiny is waiting to be released. Amen. Every person on this planet is looking for relevance and significance. Every person is. And it's a tragedy that people go through life and they die never really knowing what they were born for. I used to be like that. In fact, dying was more desirable to me than living. I never knew what my original intent, God's original intent, what he had in mind for my existence. I'm not the only one. But the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth, looking for people whose hearts is loyal to him. Let me say to you, this is my encouragement to you, and I know it's the encouragement to every leader here, is that you can't quit. These truths that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us is renewing your mind and is reassigning you into the destiny that God has purposed for you. It is bringing you into his presence. And the Lord said you need to pursue him while he may be found. He said pursue him. There is nothing out there in that world that can do you any good. Everything out there in that world is passing away. Amen. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? But see, the God that I'm talking about, he's the God that will cause you to put your hand in that basket, and every time you keep putting your hand in it, it'll keep multiplying. It'll keep multiplying. It'll keep multiplying. It'll keep multiplying. And, 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 and fat, remember the woman who, who had the prophet at her house? Amen. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the prophet said, go to your neighbors and get some jars. And, and he said, but cook that cake for me first. Yeah. Well, you know, she had a hard time with that cornbread because that's the only one she had. And, and but she made it for him. And, and he ate it. Then he said, go get some jars. And, and you see, her obedience released the miracle. It put the miracle in motion. You see what I said? I said her act of obedience did what? It put the miracle in motion. So she went and got all these jars. And so she bring all these jars, and then and then she starts pouring off. Mm -hmm. And she kept pouring. And she kept pouring. And she kept pouring. And you know what the thing about it is? Is that her husband had died, and he was a preacher. Oh. I love that. I said he was a preacher. And he was of the Levitical tribe. And, and so, 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 so they kept on pouring. And that's why she made that cake for the prophet. Did he catch that password? Yeah. But he, she kept on pouring out. And then she paid all her debt on. Everybody said she was debt free in one day. Yeah. I like that. I said, I like that. Yeah. I want to be debt free in one day. Yeah. And then she had a lot of oil and a lot of money to live on. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, 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 I just got to reach out and lay hold of that by myself. By myself. Father, I just lay hold of being debt free in one day. Those who are watching by internet, can you believe God to be debt free in one day? 
one day he said, you can be debt free. He said, let your obedience to me put your miracle in motion. Debt free in one day. Hallelujah. There's an atmosphere of faith in here. You need to try to stay in it. Yeah. I, I, do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. There's an atmosphere yeah. of the miraculous moving all around you. Yeah. And you need to let your eyes be open and your faith lay hold of it. Yeah. So I'll take that one, and I'll take that one, and I'll take that one, and I'll take that one. Just let your eyes see it. Open their eyes, Lord. Open their eyes that they might see health, healing, strength, knowledge. Just open their eyes and let them see it, God. Let them see it, God. Their home being put in order. Just let them see it, God. Let them see, let them see, it, let them see order coming to their home. Order in their relationship. Order in their marriage. Order in their work. Order in their pursuit to you. Just let them see it. And then let them reach out and lay hold of it. Let them reach out and lay hold of it. Let them reach out and lay hold of it. Let them reach out and lay hold of it. Let them reach out and lay hold of it. Let them reach out and lay hold of it. By faith. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. Mm -mm -mm. Destiny is a predetermined victory that God delivers into your hands. That's why you're more than a conqueror. Remember we said that he was working all things out for our good yes. according to his purpose yes. and we talked about that word being broke down into two things and, 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 and it was God's divine plan his original intent that has always been set before his face mm -hmm. and so therefore he says things to us like I know the thoughts that I think to us Amen. why because they've been forever set before my face. Are you listening to me? They've been forever set before God's face. And because of that, I cannot fail. Why? Because God will not fail. God will not fail you. Say, I cannot fail. I cannot fail. You see, God says you're in his Father's hand. Nobody can pluck you out of his hand. Therefore, you cannot fail because there is no lack in God. There is no lack in God. I, I'm telling you, there's an atmosphere charged of faith. You just got to put your faith on it. But listen, listen. I'm telling you, the miraculous is moving all the way. You got to believe God. Put your faith on it. There is no lack in God, so therefore, there will be no lack in me. There is no lack in God, therefore, there will be no lack. In me, there'll be no lack in my household, there'll be no lack in my children, there'll be no lack in their body, there'll be no lack in my wife's body. I say, Be healed, be prosperous, be whole. There is no lack, lack cannot live there, lack is death. Life lives in my home, life lives in my children, life lives in my heart, life lives inside. Me. No lack. no lack. I'm not having a lack attack. I said no lack. No lack. Mm. 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 We're going to stop here, God, but we're going to lift up our hands to heaven. By the God, remember, my spirit of the Lord has spoken and we receive it. We receive it. We walk out of here prosperous. Very prosperous. Very prosperous. Because we desire your presence over position. Ha uh ha. -huh. I said we desire your presence over position. And both your presence and position have put us in our divine purpose. And we will walk through this earth and we will release the potential power, 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 and the love of God into a broken and a dark world. Jesus' name. Mm. 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 Ah, man, I'll tell you something. The presence of God is in this place. Those who are looking right now, I just want you to just reach out. Just close your eyes and I just take it. 
I feel it in my home. I feel it in my hands. I feel it in my heart. And I want you to know that if you are watching this and you've never committed your, your sins to Jesus, why don't you do it now? Let him come into your heart so you can lay hold of this divine move of God that is moving right now because Jesus wants you to be part of it. He wants you to be part of it. He wants none to be lost. He wants you to be part of it. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be delivered from the darkness. He wants to pull you into his life. Ah, about that time of my Ah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I got a mission to be wealthy. I'm on a mission to be wealthy. I said I'm on a mission to be wealthy. I'm on a mission to be wealthy. I'm on a mission to be wealthy. So I can clothe the neck. I can feed the home. I can see the blind eyes open. I can see the orphans at home. I said I'm on a mission to be wealthy. I'm on a mission to be wealthy. Those people in Africa have clothes. People in there have shoes. I said, I'm on a mission to be wealthy. Give me my basaka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a rebe, be, 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 I send the word of God around the world. I'm on a mission to be wealthy. I can rebe, be, 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 Somebody say, I'm on a mission to be wealthy. For the kingdom of God. Come on, lift your hands towards heaven. Ah, uh, ah, uh, I hear the Lord said, I am so pleased. He said, I like it when you talk to me like that. He said, I like it when you talk back to me like that. He said, I like it when you talk back to me like that. He said, it pleases me. And he says, your mission is my mission. Ah, uh, he said, that's putting me first. And he says, guess what? He says, everything else will be added on to you. Hallelujah. So, Father, I bless your people tonight. Those who are watching by internet, those who are, are viewing us right now, let Jesus be your Lord. Let him be your Savior. Let him come into your house, touch your body, heal your mind, and bring the deliverance to your prodigals. Bring them back home. How they will say, we put a hook in the jaw. We call them back. We call them back. We call them back. We call them back. We bind and rebuke the spirit of stubbornness out of your home. Well, we come to court. We come against the spirit of being stiff in that cup. We call that yoke to be lifted from your neck. That yoke to be lifted from your neck. That yoke to be lifted from your neck. In the name of Jesus, the Lord will lift our heads to heaven. I bless your people with every pastor in this room. I bless your people. May they leave with redeeming power flowing in. With redeeming power flowing in. With redeeming power flowing in. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, open your mouth. Give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah.